Hi, welcome to Triggered Precision Machine. Today we're going to continue our talk on ballistics, but before we get started, we're going to go over some of the questions and comments that came after yesterday's video. And there are very good questions and comments, by the way, guys. So atmospherics and weather play a huge role in the output we get from our ballistic programs. So it's very important to understand what all these terms and concepts mean, so that way we make sure we're putting in the right data and we have the right output. And unless you're a meteorologist, this stuff is pretty confusing. So today we're going to talk about some commonly misunderstood and confused terms and we'll try to clarify some stuff so we can make sure that we're putting the right stuff in our ballistic solver. So we'll start off with altitude. Pretty simple one. We all know what that is. It's our elevation above sea level expressed in feet. So that is constant unless you physically move to a different location. Atmospheric conditions don't change your altitude. Density altitude is where things get a little complicated. So what this does is it takes into consideration air pressure and density, and it gives you a number that's expressed in terms of feet above sea level. So this number might not line up with your actual physical elevation at this time, and this is the number that we want to use when we're shooting because it incorporates these two very important variables that affect our output on our ballistic program. Barometric pressure is another one of those ones that's very commonly misunderstood. And being completely honest with you guys, I didn't fully understand what this meant until I started long range shooting and then I had to understand what this means. So the best way to describe this is it is the current atmospheric condition at your location, but the altitude component is factored out of it so it can be compared to standard atmospheric conditions at sea level. So that's getting a little complicated. So the reason they do this is because as you go up in altitude, the air pressure decreases automatically. So by factoring out the altitude component, they can compare weather patterns and stuff for meteorology. So that part of it doesn't really affect us as shooters, but we need to kind of know what that is because that's a common input that we see in a ballistic computer. Now we get to station pressure. This is another common one we see in our ballistic programs. So station pressure is very simple. That is simply the pressure atmospheric pressure at your location at that time. So a station can be anything from you holding your Kestrel or a weather station at your house, a weather station up on a hill, or some other station where it's taking the actual atmospheric pressure at that date and time at your location. So that is what we like to use for shooting because that's what affects the trajectory of our bullet and the drag on our bullet. So we'll get into all that stuff later, but for now, that kind of describes those four terms and hopefully that clarifies some of that stuff for you guys. One more thing to talk about is ballistic coefficients. This is one of those things that is highly misunderstood, especially by new shooters, and it's important that we understand what this is. We talked about this a little bit in the last couple videos, but we really didn't get into depth on what it is. So the best way to break it down is ballistic coefficient is a number that is derived from a drag model that shows how that bullet interacts with the atmosphere. So a higher ballistic coefficient and essentially the bullet is going to be more slippery and less affected by the atmospheric conditions. So we want our high BC bullets so we can shoot further and have a flatter trajectory. So now we can break down ballistic coefficient a little bit more. There's eight different drag models that scientists use to determine the effects of atmosphere on objects in terms of drag. So it tells you how much drag a certain shape is going to have going through the atmosphere. For ballistics purposes, we only use the G1 and the G7. So G1 has been used for a long time and it's still used by a lot of people, but it's important to know that G1 fits a flat base bullet profile. So that drag model is best used for the flat base bullets, kind of like the light varmint bullets and stuff like that. Whereas G7 is more in line with the bowtail bullets we see in long range shooting. What's interesting about this though is a lot of people still use G1 ballistic coefficients and they come up with very accurate trajectory tables. So why is this? It just depends on the bullet and the atmospheric conditions and everything else that you have going on. But that said, the G7 is going to give you a more accurate drag model most of the time. But what's nice about this is usually in your ballistic program, you can go back and forth between the G1 and G7 drag models without changing any other parameters. And you can kind of compare 
the trajectories with both and find the one that lines up best with what you're actually seeing in the field. So G1 for flat base bullets, G7 for bow tail bullets. So that is not a hard and fast rule, but in general, that's how these drag models are designed. Hopefully that helps clarify things a little bit and maybe now you're just slightly less confused. It's a very technical topic and I'm not a meteorologist, but that's how I understand those things as a shooter. So if you still have interest in learning more about this stuff, Brian Litz has a couple books out, Applied Ballistics. And if you buy those books, you'll learn all about this stuff. They're long reads, but it's a wealth of knowledge, everything from internal ballistics to external ballistics and terminal ballistics. And the guy's a genius on this topic. So it's worth taking the time to read that if you're really interested in this stuff. Before we move on to our ballistic cards here, one thing to be aware of is each ballistic program is going to have its own unique inputs. So one might ask for barometric pressure, one might ask for station pressure, one might ask for density altitude, and the other one doesn't, and so on and so forth. It's just important to know that all this information gets you to the same place, but understanding what the information is so you don't get these terms mixed up, that's what's very important. So use your resources, learn more about this stuff. I just mentioned Brian Litz's book. It's worth the read and you'll get better at this stuff over time too by just doing it constantly. Now we'll pick up where we left off yesterday and we'll start talking about our ballistic cards or dope cards or trajectory charts. I have a few examples on the computer we can go over and we'll just simply talk about why I make them the way I do and what I use them for. So let's go take a look. All right, we're back in the office now and I have a 6.5 Creedmoor trajectory card pulled up for us to go over. So we'll just kind of check it out top to bottom and see how I make these and what information I use. So first off, we'll notice at the very top in orange, I have the caliber and bullet information. So 6.5 Creedmoor, 140 grain ELDM. Then I have the bullet speed. And then on the right, I have the atmospheric conditions. And the reason I put those in there is that's just a reminder of what atmospheric conditions I had when I zeroed this rifle and confirmed the dope on this card. So when I get to the range where I'm shooting my competition at, I can compare the data I get off my Kestrel with those current atmospheric conditions to what I had when I zeroed the rifle. Right below that, we have our column headers. We have distance at the far left, drop in mills, wind for a five mile an hour full value wind, and then a lead for a two mile an hour moving target. And then at the very right, I have a spin drift there for the longer range shots. If we take a look at the left-hand column for distance on this range card, you'll notice that I have my 25 to 100 yard broken up into 25 yard increments. And then from 100 out to 1,050, it's in 50 yard increments. This was done on purpose because frequently at sniper matches and other tactical competitions, we shoot targets at close range and you need that very accurate dope for small targets up close. Initially, I got all this information from JB and Ballistics, and then I took that information out to the field and confirmed all of my dope out to 1,050. So I didn't shoot every single yardage on the card, but I would pick a spot every couple hundred yards and confirm my dope there. And that gives you a good idea of what your trajectory curve looks like, and then you can manipulate the inputs on your ballistic calculator to match what you're seeing in the field. I've been making cards like this for quite a while now, and the way that I use these is I'll print them out as you see them on the screen, and then I'll fold them in half in between the two separate cards, and then I'll cover them in either packing tape or I'll take them to a copy shop and have them laminated. So it gives you a nice waterproof reference card that you can use in different conditions. Now we'll take a look at a different variation of a card that I make, and this one's made to be mounted on a cheek piece and covered in a clear packing tape. So this particular card is for my Accuracy International AX308 shooting 168 grain federal gold medal match. And it has just the very basic info. So you don't see any mover values, there's no spin drift, and there's nothing else. And all it is is the dope out to 1,000 yards and 50 yard increments. It's very simple and very straightforward. And here we have one more variation to look at. And this one actually took over for the previous one we looked at just because it has a little bit more information on it and it's still small enough to be taped on your cheek piece for quick reference. One thing you'll notice about all three cards we just looked at is I use colors to differentiate between the different values and rows so it makes it easier to look at them at a glance and get information quickly. I have this card set up to show drop in 10 yard increments to 50 yards and then from 100 to 1000 in 25 yard increments. This is a little bit finer scale than I normally use and I did this because I had plenty of room on my cheek piece 
And it's always nice to have finer graduations when you're in a match and you might not have time to do some simple math in your head. Here's a good example of how I taped these dope cards to my rifle cheek piece using clear packing tape. And as you can see, I use alternating colors in the rows and that just helps you so you don't get lost in all the numbers on the sheet and it helps you pick things up a little faster. That's it for now, guys. I hope this helped to explain these topics a little bit better. This is very complicated stuff, so don't get frustrated. There's a lot of good resources out there, so find someone who is very well versed in this stuff, ask them questions, and like I mentioned before, Brian Litz's books, Applied Ballistics, are a great resource for learning this stuff. Tomorrow we're going to continue with this topic, and we're going to talk about how to true and validate the ballistic data we get from our calculators. So once again, it's a very technical topic, but this is stuff that we need to know for long range shooting. One thing I forgot to mention was I'm working on a fillable copy of these dope cards. So you'll be able to put your own data in and make your own dope cards. You can either tape to your cheek piece or print out and 550 cord to your scope rings or something like that. But I'll have them on the website very soon and they'll be free to download. So thanks for watching guys. We'll see you next time.